Hi everyone, Make Australia British again. David here. As the title suggests, today I'm going to be talking about the timeline of Australian currency and why I think changing to the dollar monetary unit was a bad idea for Australia and its culture. I know what you're thinking. Money is money, it doesn't matter what we call it, right? Well, you'd be surprised at how significant money is in part of our society, honouring British monarchs such as Queen Elizabeth II for decades now. Um, our coat of arms, the emu, the kangaroo, echidna, platypus, you name it. Changing to the dollar removed significant Australian figures from our money. For example, on the five pound note was John Franklin. John Franklin was influential in establishing the Tasmanian Natural Historical Society, the first scientific royal society established outside of Britain. And also the first governor of Australia, Arthur Phillip, was on the £10 note. How many modern Australians would know about this man? And we have more in common with the UK than we have with the US, so why are we using the US monetary unit? Also, to find a unique Australian culture, we have to reverse the last 70 years of multiculturalism and Americanness that has plagued the nation. Because Australians unknowingly have put more cultural importance on the US over themselves. As one of the main reasons why we changed from the pound to, to the dollar was to uh, facilitate better trade with the United States. So really, changing our monetary unit was really reflective of that. As we know today, Australia uses the decimal currency, its own dollar with 100 cents. However, it wasn't always this way. The early Indigenous people used uh, a series of bartering systems and uh, raw materials like seashells, boomerangs, things like that, as trading with neighbouring tribes was really common. Okay, time to get into the meat of the video. So the first coins that were used in Australia were the holy dollar and the dump. These were, in 1990, the British sent 45,000 Spanish dollars to Australia. This was then finalised in 1813, as Australia had no real currency um, at the time. Twelve years later, uh, the British Parliament passed the Sterling Silver Money Act 1825, which made British currency, or the British pound, the only legal form of currency to be recognised in Australia. This includes the half farthing, the farthing, the half penny, the penny, three penny bits, four penny bits, the sixpence, the shilling, the florin, the half crown, the double florin, the crown, half sovereign, and the sovereign, or the guinea, there were never any Australian editions of these coins. This is probably due to, by the time 1910 rolled around, there probably wasn't a use. Inflation had left the farthing redundant. So Australia basically had its own half pennies and, you know, the standard. Um, during this time, paper notes were also released. So the five pound note, the £10 note, the £15 note, and the £25 note. That just about sums up British currency. Now let's head towards Australia's first official currency, the Australian pound. The Australian Notes Act of 1910 repealed the Sterling Silver Money Act of 1825, making Australian notes the only legal tender in Australia. Gov the then Governor General of Australia, William Ward, the second Earl of Dudley, British aristocrat, authorised the Commonwealth Treasurer to issue Australian notes. How the Australian and British pound worked. Unlike the dollar, which is made up of one subunit, the cent, pre-decimal currency consisted of two subunits, pence and shillings. 12 pennies made a shilling, 20 shillings make one pound. There were many different ways to make up one pound. For example, 480 herpneys equaled one pound, 240 pence equaled one pound, 46 pences equaled one pound, 20 shillings equal one pound, 10 florins equaled one pound, and five florins equaled one pound, and four crowns equaled one pound. Uh, and then we also have the gold standard coins, two half sovereigns equal one pound, one sovereign equals one pound. They are equal in value. According to the Perth Mint, between 1889 and 1931, Australia struck more than 106 million gold sovereigns and nearly 735,000 half sovereigns for use throughout Australia and the British Empire. We stopped making gold sovereigns when Britain abandoned the gold standard in 1931 for the sterling area. This is where all of Britain and its colonies pegged their currency to the pound at a fixed exchange rate. 
So this is back to how the coins worked in ascending value. The coin with the lowest value was the half penny. An abbreviation was the hepney. So two half hep so two hepneys made one penny. Next we have the penny. Three pennies equals a threepence. Two threepence coins equaled a sixpence. Two sixpence coins equaled one shilling. Two shillings equaled a florin. Two florins equaled a double florin. Two double florins and a shilling equaled a crown. Two crowns equaled a half sovereign. Two half sovereigns equal one sovereign, as previously established, is the same value as one pound. The complete edition of notes that were issued were the five shilling note, the ten shilling note, the pound note, the five pound note, the ten pound note, the twenty pound note, the fifty pound note, the hundred pound note, and the and the thousand pound note. Although some of the higher values, a hundred pound note weren't in circulation for a very long time, about a year from 1953 to 1954. Even though the, uh, the Reserve Bank of Australia calculator estimates that it would be about $200 in today's money. This would have been a ridiculously large amount of money in these days, probably only used to exchange land purchases for farmers, for example. Of course, we know how this ends. Australia adopted its own country, the Australian dollar, on the 14th of February 1966. The first editions of the currency were pretty much the same as they are today, although one cent and two cent coins haven't been in circulation since 1992, when they were asked to be returned by the public to be melted and then moulded and crafted to be the bronze medals crafted into the bronze medals for the 2000s Sydney Summer Olympics. Would Aussie divers Robert Newbery and Dean Puller know that they're holding bronze medals made from their own currency. The only difference in design and overall shape between the coinage released in 1966 versus today is that initially the 50 cent coins were released in a circular shape like the other coins. Its shape was changed to a dodecagon back in 1969 among complaints that it was too similar to the 20 cent coin in shape and size. While the decimal system makes numerical sense, the pre-decimal system actually gives you a more tangible sense of the worth of the money or value that you're carrying. The decimal currency isn't reflective of the value of the materials that have been used to mint the money. As decimal currency is a weight-based measurement. Encyclopedia Britannica has something uh, important to say on this topic, very interesting. Silver coins, known as sterlings, were established in the Saxon kingdoms, 240 of them being minted from a pound of silver, the weight of which is equal to a later troy pound. Pre-decimal currency, similar to cash, gives the buyer or seller a more tangible value to the money that they're using. In a time where we're living an, in an ever-increasing consumerist society, moving away from using cash this is a problem because when we use card um, it can encourage bad spending habits since you're just like tap 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 and there's no physical sense of the money or transaction between the seller and the buyer that gives bonkers buyer. britain although i'm on the isle of man right now which does not belong to britain but anyway cash so cash, for the first time in a decade, cash use has gone up. And it hasn't just gone up by a little bit. It's gone up by 7%, which is actually massive and hugely bucks the trend. And it's the trend of this thing that really matters. So for the longest time, over a decade, cash has been on a massive downward trajectory. And you will know that the plan is to get rid of cash, to digitalise everything. And in fact, a bank called, I think, Macquarie in Australia has just come out and said by November 2024, no more cash, no paying in, no checks, no nothing, all digital. But because of glorious people in the UK, and I would like to say a huge well done to anybody involved in campaigns to keep our cash or keep our cash campaign, whatever, you are being glorious. So a 7% uptick, if you look at the graph, it's sizable, it's substantial. Mainstream media are trying to explain this away. They are saying, well, it's due to the cost of living crisis and people find it easier to budget if they have cash 
which begs the question, well, why are you getting rid of it then if it helps people budget? But they do not want to acknowledge that actually one of the reasons I believe that there is a shift and a dramatic shift in the trend is because of people like you, good people who are determined to use cash more, to stand up for cash so that it does help our elderly. So it gives people a reason to have conversations so that people have a form of currency they can use where you can't also be tracked, where someone one day can't just turn it off or take it away from you or control you by the use of your digital currency. So I choose to believe that this massive 7% uptake in the use of cash is down to you, is down to the massive silent majority that want to keep cash and are beginning the fight back. And the one thing I say to everyone when they ask me, what can we do? Do more of what pisses people off. The people that are trying to control us, the way we fight back is we do more of it. You, they piss you off by trying to make you a bloody locust sucking person, eat more damn meat. They want you to travel less, fly more. And they want to take away your cash today. If you can, try and do one transaction that you would have done by card. Try and do it with cash. We need to keep cash alive. It's a great conversation point for our elderly. It's a brilliant way of being able to live our lives outside of the control of the tyrannical state. And I want you to look at that graph and the uptick and know that you guys are fighting back. And that graph shows you that we are starting to win. Also, the history and culture is lost with decimal currency. So many slang terms disappeared after Britain and Australia went decimal. Here are some examples. George, do you get the pension? I don't get a full pension, not quite. Close to it. How much is that? Oh, I get uh, three bob a fortnight. So that comes to how much? Uh, nine pound, uh, nine pound seven. Nine pounds seven, that means just over four pounds ten a week. Yeah, yeah. And how do you manage to live on that? How much do you pay for rent? Sixteen, sixteen bob a week rent, and uh, the cost of living, uh, well, it'll take... The things we did to make a quick. Shortenings such as tuppence are now rarely heard, which referred to two pence or two penny. Something interesting to note, pardon the pun, that the, the value of the old currency corresponded with the same colour in the decimalised version. So, for example, the five pound note was blue, and then the £10 note and the $10 note was also blue, indicating that it was the same value as the £5 note. The £10 note was red, so when the, when the $20 note came into circulation, it was also red, indicating that it was the same value as the £10 note. <laughs> In come the dollars, in come the cents, to replace the pounds and the shillings and the pence. Be prepared, folks, when the coins begin to mix on the 14th of February, 1966. Who are you? I'm Dollar Bill, and I've come to tell everyone that decimal currency will be here from the 14th of February, 1966. What is decimal currency? Decimal currency is simply a money system worked out in multiples of ten. The base unit is a dollar, which is made up of 100 cents. But why are we changing? What's wrong with the old pounds, shillings and pence? I'll show you. Let's do a sum in pounds, shillings and pence. First, two halfpennies make a penny. Carry the penny. Five and seven and one make 13 pence. 12 pence make a shilling. That leaves one penny. Uh, carry the 12. Uh, uh, that's uh, one shilling. Three and seven and one are 11. Carry one. Three ones are three. That's 31 shillings. 20 shillings make one pound. 20 from 31 leaves 11. Uh, carry the 20. Uh, I, I mean one pound. Seven and five are 12 and one is 13. Uh, carry the one. Three ones are three. Uh, 33 pounds, 11 shillings, and one penny. Whew! Now, let's do the same sum in dollars and cents. Five and six are 11. Carry one. Three and seven and one are 11. Carry one over the decimal point. No need to convert the cent into dollars. Five and one are six, and one is seven. Two threes are six. 67 dollars, 11 cents. Now, wasn't that much easier? 95% of the world's population live in countries using decimal currency. Australia is one of the last countries to change to decimal currency. New Zealand will change in 1967. Mistakes are easily made in pound, shillings and pence. The UK was able to seamlessly transition 
from pre-decimalized currency to decimalized currency without removing the pound. The new system, the pound was retained, but was divided into a hundred new pence, denoted by the symbol P. New coinage was issued alongside the old coins. The 5P and 10P coins were introduced in April 1968 and were the same size, composition and value as the shilling and two shilling coins in circulation with them. In October 1969, the 50p coin was introduced, with a 10 shilling note withdrawn on the 20th of November 1970. This reduced the number of new coins that had to be introduced on decimal day and meant that the public were already familiar with three of the six new coins. Only changes were in relation to the subunits. The shilling was abolished and the pound was subdivided into a hundred new pence, abbreviated P, each of which were worth 2.4 old pence, which were abbreviated D. Banks received stocks of the new coins in advance and these were issued to retailers shortly before decimalization day to enable them to give change immediately after the changeover. Banks were closed from 3.30pm on Wednesday the 10th of February 1971 to 10am on Monday the 15th of February to enable all outstanding checks and credits in the clearing system to be processed and customers' account balance to be converted from pound shillings and pence to decimal. In many banks the conversion was done manually as most bank branches were not yet computerised. February had been chosen for decimalization day because it was the quietest time of the year for banks, shops and transport organisations. Many items were priced in both currencies for some time before and after. Prior to decimal day, the double pricing was displayed with the old value first, then the new value. From decimal day, the order was switched to the new price first, followed by the second price. Exceptions to the 15th of February introduction were British Rail and London Transport, which went decimal one day early, the former urging customers if they chose to use pennies or threepenny pieces to pay them in multiples of sixpence. Bus companies were the exception, going decimal on Sunday the 21st of February. Decimal day itself went smoothly. Criticisms included the small size of the new halfpenny coin and the fact that some traders had taken advantage of the transition to raise prices. General elderly people had much more difficulty adapting and the phrase, how much is that in old money or even how much is that in real money became associated with those who struggled with the change. This phrase is now often used to ask for the conversion between metric and imperial weights and measures. So Australian scholars that blame the pound currency instead of the lack of decimalization or the pre-decimalized currency are unaware that the pound at itself as a monetary unit on its own isn't actually the problem. And certainly not the main reason why Australia had to change currency. So what do we do going forward? Australia went to metric in 1974 and became one of the major English speaking countries that don't know what a pound or a mile is. It's kind of pathetic. I mean, we've had great Australian feats such as uh, inventing the bionic ear now I just feel that Australia is known for all the wrong reasons, like swearing, not having class, not taking things seriously. How can I value my own country or its culture? It has such, such a lack of national identity and conviction. Australian isn't a political ideology. It's a race of people. It's a culture. So we really need to start being tangible ideas to what Australian culture is, not just vague statement. So returning to the subject of the imperial measurement. So I think Australia should return to its pre-decimalized currency and to the Australian pound at the very least, even if it's just a cosmetic change. Interesting to also note yet again, <laughs> there are some people in the UK who do want to bring back uh, decimalized currency because it gives the UK a sense of uh, national identity because it's unique in its currency. Maybe if Australia went back to the pound, we would also be influencing them back a bit rather than just being influenced by the UK and the US. As I said, at the very least, Australia should change its currency back to uh, a decimalized pound. If you liked this video, please like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you really, really liked it, please consider donating to my Patreon um, at patreon.com slash make underscore Australia underscore British underscore again. Uh, any donations would be appreciated for me to, you know, would help fund my travels to go out and interview people all around Australia and hopefully make the country uh, British and cultural again. Thank you very much. Guys.